please can you rise to your feet and give a warm Kingswood London welcome to Pastor Mildred Okonkwa this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, praise God. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It's um, it's an honor to be here. Um, yesterday, I told Pastor Emmy that the minute he called my daddies, <laughs> I fell in love with King's Word London. Um, Yes, I am a woman under authority, <laughs> and somehow God has placed a lot of great men over me, and I am grateful for that, because somehow their guidance has led me to where I am today, um, and everywhere I go, I make boast in that, that God cares for me enough to cover me. Um, thank you. It's an honor to be here, Pastor Emi. Thank you. I met you today, Mr. Kemi. Thank you so much, um, and every one of you for coming out this morning. Um, you could be cozied up in your bed, but you decided to be here to fellowship with us. So, um, before we start, can we just share a word of prayer? Daddy, thank you. Our Father and our God, we are grateful for your love. That kind of love that crashes over us and makes us fall more in love with you. Thank you for that love that is so real, that every other love bursts from it, flows from it. Thank you because this morning I know that you will answer questions. You will give direction. Thank you for instruction. Thank you for guidance. Thank you for the grace not only to hear your word but to obey it. Thank you because we know that when we live here today our lives will never remain the same. Thank you because you are our father. Your love is reassuring, it's reaffirming, it's comforting. Thank you because your presence is in this place. And there's a work that you will do this morning that even we do not know about. But I know that you're already settling hearts. You're opening eyes, you're pointing people in the right direction. Thank you. For we know that after today our lives will never remain the same. Because we have a daddy like you. Thank you, for in Jesus' name we prayed. Amen, amen. Please celebrate God as you take your seat this morning. Praise God. Thank you for the warm welcome. So I'm just going to jump into it. Uh, do I have a timer? Because I can stand here four hours straight. Somebody needs to stop me. <laughs> okay, so what time is it now? So I should be ending at about... 11.56? Thank you. Okay. Don't worry, it will not be an eternal gospel. I will try very hard not to be like our predecessor, Apostle Paul, and say finally 10 times. I will say finally maybe about four times. Okay. Greetings from Pastor Kingsley. He will be with you, but this morning we had to split up. Even though the Bible says what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, but... This morning, we had to separate to be more productive. Um, but he sends his love um, and his wife. I don't think he can do much more than that. Okay, so let's start um, from Genesis 2. Pastor Emmy had talked about it this morning. And interestingly, when we encounter God in Genesis, that's um, Genesis chapter 2 tells us one of the things that was foremost in God's heart. And that's when God started marriage. So let's start from verse 18. Um, I like to use a lot of translations of the Bible, so just flow with me, if you will. This morning, I'll start with the easy version. So Genesis chapter 2 from verse 18. After God had created the heavens and the earth, and then the Bible says that then the Lord God said, he had made man, said, it is not good for the man to live alone. I will make a helper who is right for him. And the Lord God took soil from the ground, and he made all the animals and birds. And he brought them to the man. God wanted to know what names the man would call them. And whatever the man called each living thing, that became its name. 
So the man gave names to the farm animals, to the birds in the sky, and to all the other animals. But none of these animals was the right helper for the man. Take notes. It says none of these animals was the right helper for the man. So the Lord God caused the man to sleep. And while the man was sleeping, God took a rib from the man. Then he closed up the place in his body and he covered it again. And the Lord God used the man's rib to make a woman. And he brought the woman to the man. Then the man said, finally, this is someone who is right for me. She has bones that are taken from my bones. Her body comes from my body. And I will call her woman because God used me, a man, to make her. And because of this, when a man marries, he leaves his father and his mother. Instead, God joins the man and his wife together. The two people become as one body. The man and his wife were not wearing any clothes, but they did not feel ashamed. Now jump with me to the New Testament, and let's see where Jesus introduces his heart again. Let's go to John chapter 2. And I find this very interesting because... The first time God really introduces his heart to us, it's marriage. The first time when Jesus introduces his heart to us, it's still marriage. So John chapter 2 from verse 1, the marriage at Cana. Two days after that, there was a marriage party, and it was in the town of Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there. People had asked Jesus and his disciples to come to the party too. And when people had drunk all the wine, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. And Jesus replied, Woman, why do you tell me this? It is not my time yet. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you to do. And there were six big pots there. People had used stone to make them. And each pot could contain about a hundred liters of water. And the water was there so that the Jews could wash themselves in the way that their special rules taught. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the pots with water. So they filled the pots to the top. Then he said, now take some of the water from the pots and give it to the master of the party. So they did that. The master of the party tasted the water. The water had now become wine. And the master did not know where the wine had come from, but the servants who had given it to him knew about it. Then the master asked the new husband to come to him. And the master said to him, everyone else brings out the best wine first. When people have had plenty to drink, then they give people cheaper wine. But you are different. I need to say that again. But you are different. You have kept the best wine until now. And Jesus did this first miracle at Cana in Galilee. In this way, Jesus showed how great and powerful he was. And his disciples believed in him. Praise God. Now this story may seem different to you but it's not really so different. If you look very closely at what was happening here, the two show the heart of God. We saw God, our father in Genesis. Then he came and said, it's not good for this man to be alone. So I'll make him a helper. And what did he begin to do? He started to pre present to the man different animals. Interestingly, God didn't say, I will make him a helper and immediately made a woman. No, the Bible says that he made different animals and brought them to him. And it was what he called them that they became. And this tells me, especially for the single people in the house, that every relationship in your life is not supposed to end in marriage. You determine what that relationship should be. The Bible says what he called them was what they became. So he looked at the rhino and thought, I can't kiss this one. The horn will get in the way. He looked at the elephant and said, these ears are too big. I can't deal with this. But when he saw the woman, he knew that there's something about this woman that is exactly like me. And that's why the Bible says that deep calls to deep. He saw that there was something about her. He said the bones she has was taken from my bone. The flesh that she has was taken from my flesh. He knew there was something about her. Another thing I noticed in this scripture was that even when the man had done everything that he knew to do, he had named all the animals. The Bible says he did not find the right helper for himself. And what did God do? God put him to sleep. Now, if you go to John chapter 2, the wine had run out. 
There was absolutely nothing that the groom could do at that time. So he had to rest. If you are going to do marriage right, you have to get out of the way. Jesus has to be the center. He has to take charge. You have to get out of the way. Too many marriages have problems because we have too little of Jesus and too much of us in it. That's what makes people struggle in marriage. This is the way I am. This is the way I want it. If you want it that way, then I have a right to also want it my way. But if we both want it Jesus' way, then it will work. And so this story shows me that marriage is important to God. If God the Father, as a spirit, appeared as a spirit, and he talked about marriage, and then God appeared as a man and still talked about marriage, and the Bible tells us that at the end of time, that we will all appear at the last wedding. Listen, that means that there's something about marriage that we need to pay attention to. And you see, God is not going to come down from heaven to do marriage for you. It takes two people here on earth who take responsibility for their marriage to make marriage work. I said it to the couples yesterday, that marriage is too heavy for one person to carry. Both of us have to be involved. Both of us have to be invested. And for the single people in the house this morning, listen to me. Don't just marry a man who wants a wife. Marry a man who wants to be a husband. Men, don't just marry a woman who wants a husband. Marry a woman who wants to be a wife. They're two different things. You may want something, but are you ready for the responsibility of that thing? A lot of women want to get pregnant, but when they have children, they see how difficult it is to be a parent. So you have to count the cost. And that's what the Bible says. Which man wants to build a house? I will not first count the cost. That do I have what it takes to do this? And that's the reason why we have a lot of difficult marriages today. Because a lot of people are just following the natural order. So if I finish primary school, I will get into secondary school. After that, I'll get into university. And of course, after that, get a job. And then a couple of years after, get married. That's not what it's supposed to be. You have to ask yourself some certain questions. Who am I? If you don't find purpose, you don't need a partner. You need to first find purpose for life before you find a partner for life. If you don't know where you're going, how do you know who should go with you? So we really need to start from the foundation. Too many people are doing marriage wrong. Because first of all, you don't even know who you are. You don't know why you're here. You don't know what you're sent to do. You don't know what you can do. You don't know what your abilities are. Then you don't know what you need. So too many of us are going into marriage just based on emotions. And let me tell you, if you don't know what your purpose is, you're going to struggle with the person you choose. Let me ask you a question. If you are a teenager and someone asked you to pick a channel to watch for the, just one channel. I know we have cable TV and we have a million channels on it. And someone said, just pick one channel that you watch for the rest of your life. If you are a teenager, you know that it will affect the decision you make. You probably would pick one of these music channels. But when you get older, you realize that you can't live with just watching that music channel alone. Now, if you are much older and someone asks you to pick one channel, maybe if you're in your 40s, 50s, you probably pick a news channel. Maybe CNN, BBC, something that will give you information about the world. And the reason why you're making that decision is because you're now mature enough to know that music is not enough to run your life. Now, a lot of people are at the teenage level in their lives, and they're making a decision that is supposed to last for eternity. Who you marry has the ability to alter your life forever. And that's why it's so important. And that's why God is so interested in you getting it right as a single person. Listen, if you want to fly, you can't marry all birds. If you marry a chicken, I guarantee you, you're not going to fly far. If you're a lioness, you can't marry a dog. You can't expect a dog to roar. A dog can only bark. And that's what a lot of us do. You marry a dog and expect him to roar. And then when he doesn't roar, you complain that there's something wrong with him. There's nothing wrong with him. A dog will bark. This is one of the reasons why God expects us, if you are a believer, to marry a believer. I want to quickly share my story before I get into the other things that I want to talk to you about. And I, and I knew this morning 
just early, early hours of this morning, I knew that God was going to ask me to share this story. But I kind of struggle with it because a lot of times when I share the story of how I met my husband, one of the things that happens is that people expect it to be that exact same way. And I'm concerned because God doesn't always operate in that way. When I share, you understand what I mean. So a couple of years ago, not a couple of years ago, like 19 years now. Wow, we've been, we've been together for almost 20 years. That's a lot. So some years ago, I was in a relationship with someone else, not my husband. I was in a relationship with a guy. Uh, we had dated for about five years. He was a doctor, lives in the UK, interestingly. I think he's moved now, I don't know, but he lived in the UK at the time. Uh, we met when we were in, on campus, um, OAU, and then I graduated. We both graduated. We had done introduction. You know, families had got to know each other. We're now planning to get married. But he came to the UK to do his master's. I stayed back home to do my master's. When he was leaving, I'd even send some of my stuff. You know, it was a done deal. Okay. Um, and <laughs> when I turned 16, um, I was diagnosed with PCOS and unexplained uterine bleeds. And doctors had told me that it would be near impossible. In fact, they told me it would not be possible to have a child. But my mind kind of just said, near impossible. So I had planned my life that I would marry a doctor. Um, and I had met a doctor who was in love with me. And a doctor was in the UK, so better health care. So I planned that we would just do IVF and move on with our lives. I had a plan, a solid plan. And then when he left, one day I was, um, I was going to school. I was about to go to school. We had tutorials. And so that morning, I just woke up, went to have my bath. And as I was about to get into the shower, I had this very unusual presence of God, very strong. You know when you know that God is in the room. I don't know if anybody's ever, you know what I mean? Yes, you just know. And I've worked with God. I got born again as a teenager, so I've worked with God for a long time. So I know how he deals with me, and I know how he speaks to me. He speaks to me very clearly through the word. And so he just said to me, I want to speak to you. And so I left everything instantly, left soap, everything, and I went into my room. And I got on my knees, and I began to worship. And as I was worshiping, um, for those of you that come from Nigeria or have lived in Nigeria, you know we did, did, that we don't have light in Nigeria, right? Yes. So, of course, there was no light. But I had this old CD player that whenever the light comes on, wherever it stopped is where it will continue to play from. And so I got on my knees and I was worshipping. And while I was worshipping, the light came back on. And so the CD, the track that was playing in my CD was a Donnie McClurkin song, um, Yes, I Will Trust You, Lord. And at the beginning of that song, he begins to say, um, what if I ask you to let go of the very thing that you hold so dear? And Donnie says, yes, I will trust you, Lord. And he's singing, and I'm singing along, adly been, <laughs> singing with all of my heart, yes, I will trust you, Lord. I was just going on and really feeling very holy and righteous in myself and saying, oh, the Lord wants to speak to me. And then he just drops in my heart, John 4. And then I go to John 4, and I'm reading about the woman at the well where Jesus is saying to her, give me water. And she says, you, a Jew, asking a Samaritan for water. And Jesus said, if you knew who was asking you for water, you would ask me for water. Because the water I give, you will never thirst again. And the lady says, the water you give me, I'll never thirst again. She says, please give me this water. And then he says to her, go and call your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you rightly said, for the man you're with is not your husband. And he looked like someone used a highlighter pen to mark that line that the man you're with is not your husband. Pastor Emmy. Gang, gang. <laughs> I was like, Holy Spirit, rough player, beg. <laughs> what? The man I'm with is not a what? What? what, what, what why? Can't have this conversation. I got up, cried my bag, went to school. We are not having this conversation. First of all, I'm Ibu. The guy was Yoruba. And I had fought a battle and won. So you do understand that. My parents had bought into this whole thing. We had done introduction. What are you talking about? How can the man I'm with not, sir, what's, what's that? And so I started having this argument with the Holy Spirit. I can't, you can't do this to me. We can't have this conversation. And they didn't really swear for me. Is there anything wrong with me going to London? 
pound sterling really looks good on me, you know. It's not like, like Nigeria, they didn't look at my skin. It's we good in abroad. Do you understand? The weather, the cold, I will be yellow. I was just, you know, having all kinds of conversations with the Holy Spirit. And then I said to him, well, if this is what you want, you're going to have to do it yourself because he didn't offend me. He's born again. He loves you. He's tongue talking. He's everything I want. So why romantic? Everything. The guys write poems, make mixtapes. Yes, now you know my age. I used to do all, all kinds, you know, all the, rom all the right stuff, open doors. Guys in Nigeria don't do that. So what am I looking for again, Jesus? And then he said to me, don't worry. So we're having a conversation. The guy called me on the phone and then he said to me, uh, so he was saying something and I didn't answer him well. So he said, uh, why are you not talking? What's wrong? I feel like I'm losing you. I didn't say anything, you know, because I had a lot on my mind. He said, you know what? Let's just end this. Out of the blues, no fight, no nothing. And my phone dropped out of my hand. And then I went to bed, cried all night. The next morning he called me and says, he doesn't know what came over him. How can he say he wants to end it with me? But I held on to that. He was crying, I was crying. And I kept saying to him, no. He said, I love you. I said, I love you, but no. You've ended it, let's end it here. It's over, it's over. But all the while he was still begging, a lot was going on. And so I told God, this isn't right, this isn't fair. This boy is your son too now. Like, do you really want him heartbroken and all of that? And then the Lord said something to me. He said, ask him if you were a pastor, would he marry you? I said, that's easy. Very easy. Somebody is begging you that he wants to marry you. That's easy now. Dude, no brainer. And he's born again. No, it's no, it's a no brainer. So I pick up the phone and I said to him, I want to ask you a question. And he said, oh, anything, baby. I said, if I were a pastor, would you marry me? He said, no. I said, wait, wait. I want to help you with. Maybe you don't understand the question. If this me, me, me that you love, that you want to be with, you want to have children, you see your baby is in my eyes, just that me, the one you write for everything. If I were a pastor, would you marry me? He said, I didn't stutter. No. <sighs> then I knew that there was a problem. See, the woman at the well, God was calling her to deeper things. But he knew that whoever her husband would, was would be a lead over her life. So he was going to give her the water she wanted. But he needed to know who is the man you're going to submit this water to. He needed to know that she had somebody above her that was submitted to him as well. He didn't even think about it. He said, no. He didn't say, let me pray about it. He didn't say, well, let me. He didn't even say, why do you want? He just said, no. No. So that means I probably would have been somewhere in London with you. Nobody would know my name. Probably wouldn't be doing what God has called me to do today. And so that began this journey of God. The same way you said no, you have to tell me who it is. Because I don't have time. I'm not 20. I'm not 21. We can't do this. In fact, my mother was livid. Did this work for you? What's the problem? Don't you like good things? At this age, you want, you want to start this journey again? She was mad. <laughs> she, was, she was so upset. And so, at about that time, Pastor Kingsley and I went to secondary school together. But in secondary school, he was a bad boy. Um, Mabel and I went to secondary school as well. In fact, she was my first convert. <laughs> I got born again. And it took me 30 minutes to get to her room to say, say, Lord Jesus. She said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come. She had no clue what we were doing, but <laughs> she's still here following me about. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, my husband was not born again. I was born again in school. He wasn't born again. He used to carry a pistol when we were in secondary school. He was one of those bad boys that we all avoided in school. Because if he liked you, it was a problem, right? You can't say no to him if he likes you, so you just stay away from him. So it was a bad boy in school, so we didn't know. Ten years after, we'd graduated everything, graduated university, and then they wanted to do a reunion in school. And so they started making a call and all that. So anyhow, we, we got talking again. I'm giving you the very abridged version. So we started talking again, became friends, exchanged numbers. And then one day, I couldn't go to my church. For some reason, I think I didn't have money or something, I don't know. So I, didn't, I couldn't go to my church because my church was really far from where I lived. Um, but I felt that that's where I was called to. So, of course, I used to go there to serve. And so I left that day and thought, where can I go to worship this morning? 
Pastor Kingsley, oh, he has a church and he's close to my house. Let me just go and see. Let me even see if he's really now a man of God or whether he's still hiding a pistol in his Bible. So I got to his church that morning and he preached. And I was like, oh, wow, this guy's really saved though, you know, but not nothing of it. And so after the service, he came, said hello and said, oh, you're around. Okay, you know what? I'll take you home, but after the service, so let's just, you know, um, let me finish my meetings and then I'll take you home. You know, and by this time we had become friends. We started talking, but nothing. I had totally friend zoned him. And let me help a lo- young lady here who is single. You know, there are things in your mind, there are things in your head that can keep you from actually seeing the person that is right in front of you. Sometimes we have this is who he should be tall, dark, handsome. He should be a billionaire. He should be this. You have a list of things. And that list is keeping you from actually seeing who God has placed right in front of you. And that's exactly what happened for me. So I have this list I had given God. I will do anything you say but. So that your but this morning, you're going to take it, tear it up, and trash it. So I said to God, I'll do anything but. He must not be a pastor. He must not be an evil man. I can't deal. (laughs) I don't know. I just have this. Are there evil men in the room, by the way? Let me, let me thread very carefully. I want to thread very carefully this morning. But I just had this, you know, they can be very, they can seem very brash. You know, so I had this thing that I don't want. They're on a, they're on a phone and everybody's hearing their conversation. Hello? Are you cool? I'm like, can we just, can you guys keep it down? You know? And, <laughs> And they can come across as very arrogant, you know, very, their self-confidence, so they come across as very arrogant. That's me putting it very mildly, so. <laughs> so I had this thing, about, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not marrying a pastor, and I'm not marrying an evil man because every December back in Nigeria, they want to go to the village. And I am so not a, I, like, I don't do village, I'm sorry. I'm a city girl. I, I, I can't. I don't, I don't know about rivers and streams and all those kinds. I can't do it. I don't, I'm averse to mosquitoes. I just can't. And I don't want to go to everybody's house and greet them. Oh, until we're around. Until we're... <sighs> no. <laughs> so I just said, God, I wouldn't do that. You can keep that away from me. The third thing, I don't want a man that is hairy. Very hairy. So I was just thinking, my children, God, don't want to have gorillas. I just, you know, just had all those weird things. <laughs> Now they sound silly, but at the time, they were things I held on to. Like, I can't do this. I can't marry anybody. I can't marry a pastor. I'm not pastor's wife material. I'm not, I'm not one of those people that you offend me, and I'll just say, bless you. Oh, bless you. I'm not. Before you offend me, I read it. I will tell you, you want to be rude. I can't, I'm sensing that you want to be rude. <laughs> And, and I'm not those kind of sit down in front and just look pretty. If something's not working in children's church, I'm going to stand up and just go there and fix it. I'm going to go to traffic and, and direct the cars. I'm, I'm too can do to just sit down, look pretty, and wear a big hat and just say, bless you. And that's because that was the image of pastors that we had back then. Pastor's wives were a certain way. They were meant to be quiet all the time. I have an opinion. I do about everything, really. <laughs> so I would want to be heard. Even if you don't take my opinion, I still want you to listen to me. So I I just thought, I'm not pastor's wife material. And then on top of that, I had the whole infertility issue that I was not, most likely not going to have children. And I didn't want to do that in the public eye. My husband's a faith teacher. The word of God works 100% of the time, except that your wife isn't pregnant. I wasn't going to do that for him. I wasn't going to do that to him, no. And so I told God, I don't want any of this. So Pastor okay was obviously zero. So I didn't even see him as a potential. He didn't even come close. And I wanted a man that was romantic. We were friends and in our friendship, my husband and I, well, my husband and I, by the time when we were friends, would go out. Just, you know, how you go. And I'd be like, what's wrong with you? You can't even open doors for somebody. He says, wait do your hand. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> And I'm like, you can't call me. Say, if you want to me, you call me now. What's, what's the drama? Why must I be the one to call you? You know, so all those things that you are taught that a lady must be this way, a guy must be this way, all those things, if I were to date him, would go out the window because my husband is a, if you, if you want to talk to me, call me. Why must he be the man calling you? Like, oh, I sit now. I don't want to talk now. Stay. <laughs> so, so everything I was used to, being spoiled and pampered, I was like, this guy isn't it at all. 
So, of course, I friend zoned him, got to his church that day after the service. I was just waiting for him. I was sitting at the back. It was an amazing service. Worship was beautiful, everything. And so I was sitting at the back, and I just felt this unusual presence of God again. And so I thought, oh, ah, this place, they are very spiritual. Though. You know, you're just feeling atmosphere. <laughs> and then I, I just finished, I was just at back praying in tongues for a bit, and then I opened my Bible, and I was reading about where. I just felt an impression to read about where Samuel went to anoint David. And someone went to Jesse's house. And then Jesse's eldest brother, Eliab, came out. And God said, I don't look the way you, I don't see the way you see. I don't look on the outside, I look at the heart. That seemed a bit weird. Because I was looking at this guy on the outside. So it's when you're bringing hearts. We're not even dead, Lord Jesus. Just keep it. <laughs> and then while I was reading it, and then he brought all the seven brothers and no one. And then he said, do you have any more? And he said, yes. There remain at one. He's the youngest and he's taking care of the sheep. And then at some point when he came in, um, the spirit of God said to Samuel, arise, anoint him for he's the one. And that same highlighter thing happened. So I said, I don't understand. And the Holy Spirit said to me, what position is Kingsley? I said, he's the youngest in his family. He said, what do pastors do? I said, they take care of the sheep. He said, arise, anoint him for he's the one. <laughs> I said, Lord Jesus, let's not do this. The one that what's up. <laughs> the one that is a pastor, Ibo, Harry. No, sir, we can't do this. We can't do this. So unromantic that he was, I still call him aromatic. Like, <laughs> that's the kind of person that God said I should marry. And this takes me to that scripture that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Do you notice that they didn't say anything that there was anything wrong with your understanding? Your understanding is good. He says, just don't lean on it. You have understanding. Your understanding is great. But he says, don't lean on it. If you acknowledge me, then I will direct your path. Don't lean on your, don't lean on your understanding to lead you. I want to be your shepherd. And so I threw away everything I knew and I decided to follow God. But I said to him, there's an order from everything I've read in the scriptures. There's an order. And every time the Bible shows us that it is he who finds a wife, not she that goes after her husband. And so I said, I'm not even going to change the way I act around him. I'm not even going to act like I've heard anything from you. If this is really you, then it has to follow the natural order. And so for all the ladies who are big on Oh, let's propose to a man. You are a lady too. You can't. Let me tell you, I don't think it ever ends really well. What happens is even if you get married to that man, you have taken away from him that innate ability to chase and to hunt. And I find that a lot of women come into counseling and complain about their husbands being so laid back. He doesn't take the lead in anything. When I ask, who proposed? They say, oh, I gave him the hint. No, who proposed? Because if he wasn't even, if a man needs to be given the hint, then he wasn't really interested. A man who really wants something will go after it. And he will do whatever it takes. And he wasn't really just saying it. He was always hanging around me. That doesn't mean anything. Until he tells you, I want to marry you. He doesn't want to marry you. He's still unsure. And so a lot of women take that from the man. And then you get married and then they complain. Oh, he's not paying bills. He's not doing this. You chose to be the head of the home. There are certain things that come with being the head. So you have to stay the head. And so I let him propose. I let him do the chase. We even did the whole thing. The whole chase. Let me pray about it. But I knew. We did the whole. Let me go and talk to God about it. But I already knew. By the time he caught on. I already knew. And now, however. It wasn't really what I thought I wanted. And God kept on putting my eyes in the right thing. Friendship. There are certain qualities that the person you want to marry must have. And I know, I believe that we, I came with some resources and you have books that break all of that down. Who should I marry is one book that talks about it. There are certain things that I had to look out for. Character. First of all, I knew he was in Christ, but his character mattered. Is he the kind of person that you want to reproduce after his kind? Because God said in the beginning, be fruitful, be multiply, and reproduce. But is it the kind of person you want to reproduce after his kind? There are some people who should not reproduce after their kind. No. There are some people you should not. 
You see, <laughs> you see, the Bible says in Ephesians 2 that there's a spirit at work in us. And for those who are not born again, the spirit of disobedience. Okay? So that spirit that is at work in us, for those of us who were dead in Christ, has now made us alive. So we were dead and we are now alive in Christ. Now what usually happens is that when somebody is a believer and they go and marry an unbeliever, what you are doing is something that you will most likely not do in the natural, but you are doing it in the spiritual. One morning, God asked me a question. He said, would you go to a mortuary or morgue to go and pick a spouse? And I said, that's a bit extreme. You go to the mortuary to pick a spouse. And the Holy Spirit said, what if he's handsome? I said, he's dead. So what if he's rich? I say, he's dead, sir. He says, so why do you guys do it? Because Christian girls, especially, will go to the morgue. If he's dead, he's dead. He's dead in Christ, he's dead. So in the spirit, he's dead. And you're going to pick a dead person because he's handsome. But you'd never do it in the natural. And so God said, go after my daughters and tell them, if he's dead, he's dead. There's a spirit that controls us. Let me tell you, there's nothing as beautiful as having a challenge and turning to your husband and saying, let us pray. And you know that if two shall agree as touching anything, you hold your hands together and you open your mouth and you say, in the name of Jesus, the whole of heaven responds. But you can't really do that with an unbeliever. What is it every time? Prayer. Who prayer help? As they say in Nigeria. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Or you are even praying. And the spirit that is at work in him, the spirit of disobedience, decides, you know, everybody, everybody has a remote. You know, I hope you know that. The only difference is that when you are born again, Christian, Jesus is the one holding your remote. So he can press play. Be kind. Be loving. Be sensitive. Don't keep any records of wrong. Rewind to when you guys were happy. Fast forward over every wrong. He's pressing your remote. But an unbeliever, Satan is holding his remote. And you don't want to know what he can press. He will delete the good things. <laughs> and he will enlarge or pause the negative things. And you are praying in tongues and he says to you, she's disturbing us. Go and silence her by hitting her. So people marry unbelievers and expect them to act like Christians. The foundation is always the issue. The reason why we have so many troubled marriages is because we didn't pay attention to the foundation. If you're a single person, you still have a choice. And at that stage, you can choose God. You can choose yourself and you can choose your future. When you are still single, you have a choice. When you're married, you may choose to walk away, but let me tell you the truth. It's more complicated than you think. I sit in counseling with people all the time. And when they're about to get a divorce, I try my best to mediate. <laughs> the people who get the most damage are the children. It's not even the parents. Sometimes they move on, but the children bear the brunt. So you ask yourself, is this really what you want to do? I watched a movie a couple of years ago. And one, no, it was a series. And in one of those, uh, one of the episodes, the guy, because I like all of this, um, um, really medieval movies and series that talks about kingdoms. I think it just gives me a better picture of the kingdom of God. I honestly think that one of the reasons why we don't understand the kingdom of God is because of the era we live in, democracy and all of that. If you understand kingdom, you understand what it means to be a Christian. You understand the benefits. So I watch a lot of those movies. And in this particular movie, there were two people who were in love. The guy was to be king and the girl was a princess. But her father didn't have as much money anymore, and he wasn't as powerful anymore. So this particular guy, his own father, was trying to get him to marry another princess from another kingdom, which was powerful. And so the girl was crying and saying to him, but don't you love me? And he turned to her and said, marriage is not about love. He says marriage is for God, is for kingdom, and is for duty. Ah, I say, how can unbelievers understand this more than Christians? He said, marriage is not about love. It's not that I don't love you. She was crying. She was on the floor. And they had built such an amazing love story. And I was saying, oh, this girl, see, this kingdom thing is not that deep. 
this girl's kingdom took a rise again. You can even join forces. I was even trying, you know, from my end, I was saying, ah, this thing, this their love is deep. Oh. The way they've been, they started as children, they were betrothed. I was just talking my own. The guy turned to her and said, marriage is for God, it's for kingdom, and it's for duty. If Christians can understand it, that your marriage is first for God, if you understand that it's only when God is the center of your marriage that it can work. We talked about that yesterday. A threefold cord is not easily broken. Even when you want to separate the third cord, women that braid hair understand that. It's the third one that holds it all together. Even when I say I'm not doing it again, the third one brings you together, puts you back in the middle. You put another one, I'm not going, it brings you back together. The third fold cord is not easily broken. It is Jesus in the center that will keep you together. When you come and make your vows at the altar, what you're saying is, Lord Jesus, we're inviting you in. So when you want to go, you still have to ask him, can we go? And I guarantee you, he never lets you go. Never. Except your life is under threat. He never does. He will say, stay there and work. Stay there and love. Stay there and pray. Stay there and be patient. Because the same way I'm forgiving you, go and forgive others. The same way I'm in heaven making intercession for you, you go and intercede for your partner. And so marriage is a call to ministry. It's not just about how we feel. It's a call to ministry as Christians. And I think that that's one of the things that we're forgotten. It's a call to the prophetic. It is two people speaking God's plan over each other's lives. I can't count the number of times I have been in prayer and God just begins to show me a picture. I tell Pastor K every day, I say, where you are right now, you haven't scratched the surface of what God wants to do. And there are things that God has shown me over the years and that have come to pass today. And I believe that God will show no other person but me. Because two of us have become one. So as he's showing me his future, he's inevitably showing me my future. Take all to the prophetic. That you can speak. And let me tell you, a lot of times when men, especially women, when men are proposing to you, they'll tell you a lot of things. I'm going to do this, I'm going to be that, I'm going to... Life happens. And then along the line, they start to forget. As a wife, one of your duties is to prophesy and speak it back to him. That this is what God said you'll be. Have you forgotten this is who you're supposed to be? These are the nations you're supposed to take. This is what you're supposed to do. This is what God said about us. And as a man, you're supposed to be a cover. You're supposed to, be a, you're supposed to see visions concerning your life and your destiny. It's a call to prayer. It's a call to war. You know, a lot of times people don't understand that we're at war when it comes to marriage. And I say this all the time because I feel like too many people don't understand what God is trying to do on the earth. God wasn't bored. He wasn't bored when he decided to make a woman. He said, it's not good for this man to be alone. I will make him a helper. Why? Because I want him to be fruitful. I want him to multiply. I want him to take over the earth. There's so much that I want him to do. There's an assignment. But a lot of times, we fight the person we're on assignment with. God showed me a picture a couple of years ago about how marriage, kingdom marriage is like being at war. And then you're at war and the person, I don't know if I can have a husband and a wife here. Can I have a husband and wife? Anyone? Anyone? Where's your wife? Thank you. <laughs> you understand the assignment. <laughs> okay. Could you come up here, please? Just stand beside me. I want to show you something that God showed me a couple of years ago. So we're at war, right? We're at war now. War. No, you're not fighting each other. You're not fighing each other. <laughs> we're at war. There's war. These are the people we're fighting. Enemies. Well, so, so, you know what? You know that's what, what has begun to happen in marriages. When you say at war, couples start to fight each other. <laughs> How did it not occur to you that we're at war against everybody else? <laughs> And that's why yesterday, my emphasis was on the fact that we're a team. We're a team. You don't fight your teammates. You don't fight your teammates. We're a team. He pointed it first. Retaliation. That's another thing couples do. I'm not here for couples today. We talked yesterday. So let me focus on. So you are what? These are our enemies. We're all fighting, right? And she's supposed to have your back. So I point gone now. We're fighting. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> so these two people are fighting against all of you right and then imagine she's supposed to be covering him 
Okay? Because you guys are shooting. You're shooting at them. So she's supposed to be covering him. Yes, she's supposed to be covering him. Cover him. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Please don't let me change this couple. <laughs> okay. So you're supposed to be fighting. You're supposed to be doing this. Then imagine all of a sudden, she just remembers that he did not remember her birthday last week. So she's not covering him again. She decides to just stand. You know what's going to happen? Both of them are going to get killed. And that's what we do in marriage. We always major on the minor things. He didn't remember my birthday. Remind him. It's not even that deep. And if you want a surprise, you tell him that this is what I want and I want it as a surprise. And when he comes, act surprised. It's not, it, honestly, it's not that deep. The real problem is that they've made it seem like when somebody has done something like that, then they have destroyed everything. You have to be conscious that you are at war. You have an enemy. And the person you are playing with is not playing with you. Satan is not joking. Satan is not a nuisance. I say it everywhere I go. Satan is an enemy. There's a difference between a nuisance and an enemy. A nuisance wants to annoy you. An enemy wants to kill you. Steal, kill, and to destroy. And so he comes to distract you so that you can get killed. Couples that should be covering each other are fighting against each other. And from the very beginning, God made it clear who our real enemy is. The enemy is not man, it's not woman. The enemy is Satan. I will place enmity between you and the woman and her seed. Somehow, we don't remember that scripture. So he did not remember my birthday, she puts her gun down. He did not remember our anniversary, she puts her gun down. He says, I'm sorry, she takes it up again, but somebody has shot his shoulder, so he's wounded. Now he's wounded in his shoulder and he can't carry the load he would normally carry for her. She's angry again. She puts her gun down. They shoot him in the second shoulder. So marriage keeps getting worse because instead of fixing it, we're fighting each other and we're getting more wounded. And I've come this morning to remind you of the real assignment. You are a team. Hold each other's hands. You are a team. You don't put down your gun for any reason. If he upsets you, still protect him while you're telling him, you missed my birthday. If she annoys you, still protect her while you're telling her, what you did last night, I don't like it. But we're at war and we must never put our guns down. But more importantly, we must never point it at each other. Please let me clap for them as they go back to their seats. So I know that there are people who have difficult spouses and I just want to quickly drop this for you. A few things that you can do if you have a difficult spouse. And the truth is, there are different stages of marriage, okay? So there are different times when your partner will offend you. And that's what love really is. Love is that you are patient with that person. It means that you are kind. Kindness means that the person doesn't deserve it, but you do it anyway. And I know that, yes, it's very annoying, but if you understand what the real assignment is, then you will know how to handle it. So let me give you five things you can do if you have a difficult partner, okay? Um, I was talking about different stages. The first stage is when we attract, and that's the beginning stage where it's like the whole honeymoon thing. We're all happy. Everybody's in love. Everything they do, even if they fart, it smells like roses. You know, everything is just great at that stage. And then we move to the second stage, which is where people start to frustrate. So the things that you found attractive will become frustrating for you. So like yesterday, I was saying that my husband and I, in fact, really, I, we are proof that the word of God is what you need in marriage. Because once again, I are so different. We see life differently. Everything is so different. This is someone, that, like I said, I'm a saver and he's a spender. When we were getting married, we went to price a hall, we went to check, negotiate for the price of a hall. We got to the hall. And when we're still talking about the amount and everything, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to make the money to pay for it. My husband said he wanted to use the bathroom. And so he left. A good 15 minutes later, I didn't find him. So I said, let me go and look for this man. I can't somebody, we, we're not even married. Because when we came to look for, I can't find him, what's going on? So I went, as I was going down, they, they pointed me in the direction of the bathroom. As I was going downstairs, I saw him and the person who was renting the hall. They were talking about two pit bulls that the guy had shipped in from the UK that he wanted to sell. We didn't have money to pay for the haul we came for. My husband was pricing dog downstairs. <laughs> that should have been a red flag, but I thought, 
We moved on past that one. When we got married, we could barely eat. I'm telling you. <laughs> I thank God for where we are today. We could barely eat when we got married. Things were really like it was, you know, my husband was working, but you know how ministry is, especially if you're starting, you put everything in, and he was in full time ministry. And we were doing nothing else but ministry. Nothing else. No, we couldn't sell books. We couldn't do anything. All the books he was selling, the God told him then to put everything back into ministry. So nothing. He wasn't doing anything but ministry. My husband, my husband went out one day and came back with a South African bubble. A dog at that time that cost 200000 to pay small, small. If I say instrumental, it doesn't. To pay small, small. And they said the dog, oh, I don't know how to explain all these things, so in, uh, in British English, all these in it things you could do here. But it's one derica of rice that the dog used to eat. One derica of rice, one full Titus fish. That's it's mackerel, right? Mackerel. Titus fish. We, that's what we will eat for one week, sir. That's what my husband went to bring dog daily. In fact, when, when he bought the pebbles, he told me that he couldn't buy one. Because we're negotiating, like, okay, at least buy one. He said, no, that if he buys one, it will be lonely and it can die. I don't know why my brain, my brain did not even figure it out at that time that this man is telling me rubbish because people have one dog. He said, no, that the, the, the dogs are siblings, so we have to buy them together or one would die. I can't begin to tell you the crazy kind of spending that this man does. I was so frustrated at some point. I went to the, ah, it's even maybe you were the one with me. I went to her, ah, thank God. Because if I say, if I say something that is not true now, she can tell you people. We went to the U US. God has started blessing us. We went to the US to have my child. That's even another story entirely. We went to have my child after I got pregnant. Go to the US. And there was money in my account. Maybe I remember when I was flexing. I said, there's money now. I now know what it means to be rich. We're not wealthy, but I want, you know, you can buy things without really looking at the price because you know you, you got this covered. So I go to the shop. I was thinking, oh, this for my baby. Oh, what does this do? They say, I said, I don't care. Just bring it, <laughs> baby. I was shopping. Got to the counter. I gave the American, oh, Ibo woman, my card. She's like, oh, I'm sorry, do you have a card? This is declined. I said, maybe I'll wait till she talk. Maybe I say, she said the card is declined. I said, I heard that, but it's not possible. I said, please try it again. She said, okay. She did like this. She said, I'm sorry, the card is declined. Do you have another card? I just looked up my phone. I said, hello, honey. They said my card is declined. It's not possible. He said, oh, sorry. I forgot to tell you. My husband just carried, I will even say it here. It's online, she. Oh God. <laughs> 25 million naira. That time. My husband carried all the money in our accounts and sold it. I didn't tell me. My tummy started, I didn't know whether I was, I was in labor or I was purging or my tummy just started turning. The woman was still saying, oh, okay, we can have it in layover. I was just going, maybe I was saying, should they have it in lay away for you? I said, you're not going to come up for there. They're going to so embarrass you. <laughs> I said, I was, I, was, I was in shock. I could, you know how you would say, okay, put in lay away. I couldn't talk. Like, how, who does that? You leave your wife in America and wipe out our account. Who? who? <laughs> Thank God. As I was going home, maybe I was asking me. She said, so what are we going to do now? <laughs> I said, don't worry. God will take care of us. Let's just be going home. It's Pastor K. It's, 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 it's okay in Jesus' name. Let's just be going home. This is, you know, I, so I could have put down my gun. Or I could have pointed it and rightfully so I should have pointed it at him. But <laughs> at that time, one of the, God, that was at that time that God started teaching me some of the things that you do when you have a difficult spouse. Because you see, a lot of people think that, oh, wait, people call us couple goals. But you have to, let me tell you, you have to survive some of the frustrate stages. Where most people get a divorce is at that stage when things start to frustrate them. Things, when things like, my husband can be, he used to be very unemotionally available. Like, you would tell him something, you would be crying. Like when I couldn't, when I, when I couldn't get pregnant, I'd be crying. Cry. 
And every normal human being that I know would at least hold their wife or something. I'll finish crying. My husband went and say, So are you pregnant now? I'm like, sorry. He said, What were you crying? I said, It's because of all this thing. I'm a baby. He said, And so now that you have cried, are you pregnant? I said, You can't ask me that. He said, No, no, he's just asking no. Because the way I was crying, this cry, he thought that when I finish crying, I'll be pregnant. So I have to start teaching. You see, everybody has their own challenges. Your own may not be a husband who is unemotional, you know. Obviously, he has changed now. He's now, in fact, sometimes like, what's wrong with you? I better calm down. But at the time, it was, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom how a human being could be like that. That your wife is crying. Or you tell him you did this thing, say, okay, I walk away. Come back. You can't say, okay, okay. So, okay, what am I supposed to do? I'll say, say sorry. Say, yeah, but I'm sorry now. But that's not my, let me, let me go and fix it. No, first tell me sorry. Give me my sorry first. I will hold it. Then you go and fix it. You can't just say you're going to fix it without taking responsibility for what you've done. So I started praying. And my prayer was in twofold. Lord, make him a man that is teachable. Because one of the things I've learned is that in marriage, we teach each other how to treat each other. You are the one that will teach your spouse. Because another woman may not mind that he didn't say sorry. But that sorry is important to me. I'm not going to use it to end, but give me. It's my own. Like I have a right to be apologized to. And I want it. Some other women say it's okay. And he doesn't say sorry, but you buy me some chocolate. I don't care what you buy. Apologize first that you buy whatever you need to buy. I'm not even saying don't buy, but apologize first. But some women are okay. So I have to teach my husband this is what I want. I want communication. I want you to call me. I want you to talk to me. I want you to, what, you see him and say, what are you thinking about? I say nothing. I say, then think with me. That nothing is what I want. I want to know that nothing. So I don't want to stress you. I'm already stressed. So it's better you tell me what's in your mind. Because a lot of men put their wives in trouble. They will say, oh, I got this. But they don't got nothing. So if you would just tell her what the problem is, not that it's this small, we can pray about it before it becomes worse. So I'll close with this. Five things you can do if you're dealing with a difficult spouse or you are in a difficult spot in your marriage. So number one, pray for each other. Pray for your husband, pray for your wife. We have a book out there. I don't think I brought mine though, but my husband's there when he's there. Praying for your husband, praying for your wife. Um, scriptures that I prayed over the years over him. I put them in the book. And God taught me at this point that there's a difference between praying about your husband and praying for your husband. Praying about your wife and praying for your wife. Because that's what a lot of people do. A lot of people stay in the praying about stage where you complain about your partner to God. He doesn't do this, he doesn't do that, he doesn't do that. And praying for your partner is more important because you are beginning to find all the promises of God concerning them. And you are speaking it over them so that becomes their reality. So I stopped praying about my husband and I started praying for him. I started declaring that you, your heart will be tender towards the things of God. You will learn to deal with me with understanding so that your prayers will not be hindered. You will not be like a man that does not have self-control. You will not be a city without walls so that anything can enter and come out. You will drink waters from your own well. You will find other women repulsive. I started praying for him. Because I found out that all my complaining made no difference. But when I started to speak into him, I began to call those things that be not as though they were. I saw a change. So the first thing, please don't play with prayer. It's one of the greatest powers we have as Christians. You can correct any situation when you call God into it. Number two, praise your partner. Don't just complain about the things that they don't do. Praise them for the things that they do. I don't like when you do this, but when, you, when I do something you like, you don't tell me. So tell them the things that you do like. So as frustrating as all the other things he was doing was, I found out that he was attentive to me. And every time I said, don't do this anymore, I don't like it, he wouldn't do it. So I'll tell him, I love the fact that you listen to me. Just that you don't listen to me all the time, sha. He would not laugh. What is it again? What did I listen to you about? And then you must find the right time to bring it up. There's a right time. There's also a right attitude. So a lot of men complain about women not being disrespectful. They say, I respect him. No, you don't. Your attitude, your tone, and timing is what determines whether you respect a person or not. The third thing, project on him. What you want to see done to you. Take the initiative. That's what Jesus said. And do it to them. So when we first got married, my husband was not big on, he would just wake up in the morning and just walk past you. And just continue. Because like, he had only brothers. He grew up, and his mom 
who is the only woman in the family is a soldier. So, in fact, he grew up amongst men. So he really didn't understand how women can be emotional. He did, he'd never seen his mom cry. His brothers are all guys. So he, didn't, he just didn't understand how to be around women. So I had to start teaching him that when you wake up in the morning, you hug me and say, good morning. So when I wake up in the morning, I will hug him and say, good morning, darling. And he, at first, he was weird about it. He would just stand. Then after a while, or he would think that, oh, that means sex. No, sir. It's just good morning. Now walk away. Back up slowly. <laughs> I had to start teaching him. By doing the things I wanted him to do, even the money issue, I had to help him start saving money. I was secretly stealing his money into an account I had opened for him. Four years later, when he asked me how much it was, he was shocked. Because one day he just called our accountant, why is Pastor K moving, Pastor M moving out 100K every week? Because he was making a lot of money, but he was spending it recklessly. And so I was moving out money I knew he wouldn't notice. I don't know 100K, 100K, I was just moving secretly like that. He now called my accountant. This thing is true. Why is Pastor M doing this? She's now said, please ask her, sir. Now called me and said, why? I said, four years. It's now you are noticing, sir. Four years. I said, it's your money. You'll see your account. I showed him everything. And I said, this amount of money is what you've saved. He said, let me do it consciously. Then he now started consciously saving. Because he had seen. So project on them. The fourth thing, patience. Mm, you need large doses of patience because once you start doing these things Satan will start to try to throw a spanner in the works he will try to make you feel like he's not walking he's getting worse she's getting worse she's getting be patient the Bible says it is through faith and patience that we obtain the promise then finally protect yourself protect your peace protect your mind protect your space even if the person is being toxic, you have to protect your mind. I always tell women, I don't know about men, but women, I always tell women when you're getting into marriage, hold Jesus with your predominant hand. If you are left-handed, hold him with your left hand. If you are right-handed, hold your right hand. And then hold your joy with the other hand. You need Jesus and joy to survive in marriage. Whatever they are doing, smile and move on. Always tell yourself it's not that deep. If he doesn't apologize, will you die? No. But we make it seem as if we will. How can he not say sorry? How can he keep doing this? If he's doing it and doesn't want to change, you move on now. It's not that deep. Why does he throw his clothes around, pick it up, or get someone to pick it up? Move on. Is he not an adult? Well, he's not acting like one. Move on. Protect your peace, your mind. Don't go mad over marriage. But it's not that deep. It's not that deep. When you do things for him, he doesn't say thank you. Then tell yourself thank you. Say thank you, Mildred. You're great. You, you did a fantastic job. You're a wonderful wife. Say it. Nobody said I must come in from him. You want thank you, then tell yourself thank you. Protect your peace. Protect yourself. And when you do these five things and put Jesus at the center of it, I believe that you will have the marriage of your dreams. And before I go, I really want to just call on... I want to make one, There's one particular thing that God has laid in my heart this morning. And that's the fact that God wants more and more people who are ready to use their marriage as a ministry. And when I mean ministry, I don't mean that you're just, you're going around preaching. Maybe that may be what God told you to, but no, maybe not. What I'm asking you this morning is to see that your marriage is to be a tool of worship to God. God wants to show people like he did in, in John chapter 2. When he told them to take the wine to the guest at the party. And they said, there's something different about this wine. He made them ask, what happened? And when you start to show people that you can do marriage differently, they will ask you, how? And that gives you an opportunity to talk about Jesus. That's what real ministry is. It's not that you carry your Bible and hit them over the head. It's that they can see you living it out and that it is possible. So this morning, I want to make a call to people who are willing to begin to do marriage right. People who will constantly remember that we're at war. You may not be married now, but you say, Lord, like Hannah, you're saying, if you give me this man, this is what I'm going to do with him. I'm going to give him right back to you. So this morning, I want to, if you're in the room, I just want to pray with you. I don't know if it's everyone. I don't know if it's some people. I don't take it for granted that everyone wants that kind of marriage. So I'm just going to ask if it's some people, then just rise with me and let's say that prayer together. just want to pray over you this morning. There's a grace to do marriage right. Honestly, I tell my husband every day, I say, listen. If someone has married you, you'll be divorced by now. Let's tell ourselves the truth. And if somebody has married me too, you'll be divorced by now. Because it's not like I'm really all right like that. It's Jesus that is just holding me. Do you understand? Holding me together. And God knew the kind of person that can live with me. 
and God gives us the grace. So every time we learn something from the word, we push it out there. And that's what I'm doing this morning. We made up our minds that our mind will be ministry. That people will look at us and say, if these people can do it, despite their differences, if these people can do it, despite all the challenges they've been to, just name it. Just throw any challenge at me. I can tell you categorically how God has helped us through it. God. Not any man, God. That's what makes your wine sweet. Makes you different. So this morning, if you will lift your hands to heaven with me, let's just pray. If you can just pray in the spirit for a bit. The Bible says that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. It's right there inside of you. I need you to use your prayer language to unlock it this morning. Rekete ya lebo sadali ya mamra halegedere rakatali ya mamra halegede shata e manda ya lekedi sabra halegede rakata ya likede dia lebo shata e mahanda kali abraham legede unlock it this morning man brehelegedi sha e mahali ya bahande kelegedi sabra halegede rakata ya lekedi sadali ya mahalegede and abrahado shata in katuza namra halegede kiala gadeisha. E madima na noko seteli ya bahande gede Adio satari ya mamra hale gedishta Ya kada kaya le gede ke yada kaludosa Rekete ya le bahanda kaya le gedisa O prataya lika na naki ya kadeke de Ya manzo brenge like de Thank you Holy Spirit Thank you, thank you, thank you Amadad ya naro shata Thank you Holy Spirit I know there are some people in this room God says that you came in here very upset. You came in with your partner, but you're upset. It's not even visible. You're talking, you're doing everything, but deep in your heart, you've locked it up somewhere. There's one thing they've done or they've been doing consistently that has hurt you. And you've said you will never let it go. In fact, you made a decision this morning that no matter what happens, that you will just run through the period where your children grow up and then one day you will just carry your bag because you cannot deal. But this morning, the love of God that has been shed in your heart, I declare will burst out in the name of Jesus. It begins to overflow and to heal your heart and to flow into your partner. There's someone else here. You made a decision that you will never get married because of the things that have happened to you in the past. You've made up your mind that marriage is not for you. And God said, I should tell you, that he determines who marriage is for and that he has chosen to use your marriage for his glory so satan is trying to confuse you and to distract you from the real assignment because you are actually called to marriage god is giving out babies this morning he says no shall be buried in king's word he says whether male or female whether the problem is from your husband or is from you I declare there's a turn around now in the name of Jesus I hear it clearly None shall be buried in King's word. Hey, Kale the day. He says this is a fertile land. A man dear don't call Shetege Lege Day. Imbra Tose Kelia Bahande Gede. And even from today, anyone who walks in here looking for a child. Hey, my lady day. This is the house of solution. Amen. The Abrada Kalu do sete. Rakada yelege de 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 sete yale de boshata. Eh, dayale ke de. The Bible tells us that the barren womb is always hungry. Ah, but the word of God says this is the house of bread. When they come here, they will be full. They will have multiple births, twins, triplets. Taka ya de ki sote lege de de de. Ramando robo shata. We declare, we believe the report of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, God is healing hearts right now. Your heart may have been broken. 
but God is healing hearts. Jesus said, I came to heal the brokenhearted. I declare healing all over the room. Ah, the Amoshata, it may have been your partner. It may have been an ex-boyfriend. But listen, God is giving you, he's beginning to heal your heart. And he's giving you the grace to move on. So that you don't punish your next for the sins of your ex. Ah, Tibra no shata le abahane gele. Ah, ni amose kele kede shata. I see someone's heart, Mata Kadosha. Someone's heart is so darkened. It looks, it looks really like shriveled and black. And I see the love of God is beginning to give it color again. Like the blood of Jesus is beginning to pump into that heart again. It's pumping in life, but it's pumping in love. Ah, yaliba do shata. There's healing in this room. Take what you need. There's healing right now. Ah, badado shata. There's healing right now. Kadaya kalegede. Rabado shata. Liamamra halegede. Ah, diabado shata. Yalegede. He's easing the pain. He's easing the pain. Ah, mado shata. Liamakado sete. E diamato se kelegede de de shata. E brado ko sete. For that person that made up their mind that they're leaving after the children, God is saying, no, that's not the solution. He's going to fix it now. He's going to fix it now. Your spouse's eyes will be open to your pain from today in the name of Jesus. And I declare healing in your heart, healing in your home. The shalom of God takes residence in your heart right now. In the name of Jesus, there's a turnaround in your heart. You will not leave. God says this is where you will find peace. This is where you will find joy. This is where you will find love. There's someone else. God is saying, give it a year. Give it a year. Let me dig around it again. He says, let me dig around it again. Give me one year. It will grow. God is saying it will grow. He's fixing your partner. But more importantly, he's fixing you. He's fixing how you respond to situations. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your healing power. Thank you for your love that is flooding this room. Thank you, Lord. 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 I silence every voice that is not the voice of God. I declare over your home and over your marriage from today, the voice of a stranger you will not hear. All negative voices that come to interfere in your marriage, I silence them today in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Uh, thank you, Heavenly Father. Before I go, I need to say this. God said the most important thing that you need to know is the instruction that Jesus' mother gave to the servants. It's the instruction I bring to you this morning. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever Jesus says to do, do it. If he says forgive, do it. If he says apologize, do it. It doesn't make you less of a man. It doesn't make you less of a man. Even if you are not wrong, if he says apologize, apologize. If he says forgive, forgive. Whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. Father, we thank you. We're grateful for your word, but above all, we're grateful for your presence in this place. And the work that you've done in our hearts, apart from this message, we give you all of the glory. For we know that even after today, you're doing more and more in our lives. We declare marriages in this church blessed in the name of Jesus. I declare eyes to be open. Your word says that none shall lack a mate, for your spirit will gather them today together. I declare divine connections in the name of Jesus. You will not walk in error. You will not miss it in marriage. You will fulfill your destiny and have the marriage of your dreams. For in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, celebrate Jesus. Come on, put your hands together for Pastor Mildred. What a great time, what a great time, what a great time, what a great time. You know, as she was just ministering, you know, the, I was just sensing in my heart, you know, sometimes God releases words to transform relationships and marriages. And then sometimes there's a release of the Spirit. There's a release of the Spirit and it just goes into people's lives 
and begins to turn things and begins to fix things and begins to influence people you know and this song was just ringing in my spirit and i was like it's uh, it's like the chorus in this song and i was thinking where did i get this from and i was looking for it and i thought i don't i don't think i knew this song but the chorus i just kept ringing in me was release the fullness of your spirit shekinah glory come shekinah glory come release the fullness of your spirit shekinah glory come shekinah glory Shekinah glory come Shekinah One more time, say release Release the fullness Of your spirit Shekinah glory come Shekinah glory come and So I see an outpouring of the Spirit An outpouring of the Spirit on individuals, on couples on relationships, on marriages, hallelujah. And like Pastor Mildred was saying, give him one year, one year to walk on your relationship and your marriage, to walk on your marriage, one year to dig around, to establish things that are not there, to fix things that are not right. And we are willing to wait on the Lord. And so Lord, we thank you for the release of your spirit upon everyone here. And everyone that is listening and watching online. And we thank you for the outpouring of your spirit that transforms relationships and marriages. Because we know that by your spirit, their marriages will not remain the same. By your spirit, their lives will not remain the same. We give you all the praise and all the glory for this now. In Jesus' name, amen.